the plan for today was you have a look through how to make the hydrogen halides. A few people got in touch with this, just sort of a bit overwhelmed with all the information that there was about this. Um, looking at the ones that people have handed in via Edmodo or via email, uh, people are getting very similar things. Um, it, Looks like one or two of you might just copied and pasted. Um, so we're going through this to, to make sure you understand why these things are happening uh, and why it's important uh, beyond just passing the exam, because obviously this will be on the exam as well. But this, uh, these sorts of things are important industrial processes that are used uh, in everyday life as a real chemist. So this was the task, uh, and as I said, there was a slightly different method for each sort of uh, halide. Now, it's not necessarily for each specific halide. There are two groups that we use slightly different approaches for. So there are a few different ways of making the hydrogen halides, um, but there's only one that we talk about at A-level chemistry. Uh, and what we do is we take what we call an ionic halide. So that's uh, a halogen that's in an ionic compound. For example, sodium chloride is a very readily available uh, ionic halide. So that's what we tend to use uh, most of the time just because it's easy to get hold of. Uh, but things like potassium bromide, uh, calcium iodide, they're, they're all fine too. So we get our ionic halide uh, and we add to it a concentrated acid. Now, the concentrated acid is the thing that is different, okay? The main part of the method for making these things is pretty much the same. The big difference is what acid you choose to use. Um, and the two main ones that we talk about at this level are phosphoric acid and sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid you've probably used before quite a few times. Uh, we tend to use hydrochloric um, in school just because it's kind of easy to get hold of uh, and not too dangerous in the right concentrations. However, you might have used sulfuric. I don't think you'll have used phosphoric acid for anything. Um, no, no practicals are jumping to mind right now. Uh, so when we're trying to decide, and when I say we, I mean industrial chemists, when you have got a chemical factory that you're responsible for, you have to make choices about what chemical reagents or reactants you are going to be using. And when you're thinking about that, what you need to consider is safety. How safe is it to handle this chemical, transport this chemical? If there's an explosion at your factory, what does that mean? What will that look like? Um, are there any special transportation things you have to bear in mind for it? So safety. Cost uh, in industries, as we all know, things cost money. Things cost a lot of money. So it's very important for a chemical uh, company to actually get their money's worth. So they want to have a lower cost as possible to maximize their profits. Whilst hopefully not cutting back on safety measures, uh, because if you don't do safety measures, you get sued, which then costs money. And how easy is that acid to actually make? Is it readily available? Um, is it really hard to get hold of? Is it easy to get hold of, but it takes a long time to get? There's all sorts of these things to consider. So what I've got on the next slide is just a quick overview. Now, these I will send this uh, PowerPoint out at the end of this lesson. Uh, I'll send it via email and via Edmodo. Um, I've been putting most updates on Edmodo uh, first and then folding it up with an email just in case. Um, but you're all seeing pretty good at using Edmodo so far. So phosphoric acid, let's have a look at it in terms of safety. So safety wise, uh, the concentrations that we are dealing with, they are sort of this level. So we are looking at something that is quite corrosive. Uh, danger can cause severe skin burns and eye damage. That's not good. Uh, for a 15 minute exposure, the concentration of the vapor in the atmosphere, so the gas, uh, should not exceed two milligrams per meter cubed. That's not particularly pleasant at all. Uh, it reacts violently. It gets very, very hot when mixed with water. Um, it will even thermally decompose to form toxic oxides of phosphorus. Um, I believe the correct phrase is oof. That, that's, that's not good. That's not comfortable. Um, so safety wise, that does not look particularly pleasant. 
Manufacturing, let's have a look at the manufacturing process here. So uh, this is just a website I found earlier that talks about the manufacturing of phosphoric acid. Um, so they've got three different methods of doing it. Uh, there's a common route. We can make fertilizers. Fertilizers are very important. We touched upon them at GCSE. Uh, you can get different purities. Um, ooh, reduced environmental footprint for the last method. That sounds quite good. And saving costs. Industrial chemists are going to like that. Uh, what else have we got? Yeah. Um, so it's produced by reacting oh, sulfuric acid anyway, so you would need sulfuric acid to make this stuff uh, with a naturally occurring rock, so that's not too bad. It makes a rock uh, pretty low temperature there, that's not too bad at all. Uh, neither is that one. Uh, evaporation of the solvent, yeah, that doesn't seem too bad at all uh, for a chemical process. Uh, Cost then. Cost can make and break this. Let's have a look. Okay, so this again, this is just a, a chemical industry uh, purchase website. Um, so the phosphoric acid, 85%, that shows uh, that concentrated version. And all these are slightly different forms in slightly different quantities. Um, but we're looking there at about $61 for 500 mil. Um, to put that in context, that's like two mugs full if you're having a cup of tea. How English is that? We compare it to making a cup of tea. Uh, two mugs full cost you $61, £49, 47 English pence. Lovely. So as a sort of overview then, it sounds pretty dangerous. Uh, making it does need another acid anyway. Um, and the cost, let's compare it to sulfuric acid. So sulfuric acid, uh, we've, I'm just going to use this little overview this time instead of clicking the link because the overview is a little bit easier there. So concentrated sulfuric acid, corrosive again, so the same as the other one, uh, danger, severe skin burns and eye damage, same as the other one, uh, reacts violently, becoming very hot when mixed with water, yes, that was on the other one as well. Uh, 15 minute exposure, vapor concentration should not exceed 0 0.15 and what was it for the previous one? Okay, so it's a tiny, tiny bit slightly more dangerous there, but then actually this can also undergo thermal decomposition and form toxic oxides, whereas this one doesn't. So from a safety point of view, the sulfuric acid looks slightly better. Uh, let's compare it to the manufacturing. Um, so, okay, it, oh, cool fact, sulfuric acid is the largest volume industrial chemical produced in the world, 200 million tonnes per year, that's crazy, and they use concentrated acid in all sorts, uh, concentrated sulfuric, so that's really cool, so it's already really well established uh, as, a, a used, as a used chemical, as a processed. A um, few different ways of getting it, ooh, molten sulfur is not particularly pleasant. Um, but then actually you can make it from waste products anyway. So that's that's making a waste product useful that would otherwise just be waste. Um, so there's better versions of it being available. High temperature. Yes, agreed. That will be quite expensive in terms of the fuel input that you've got there. Catalyst, though, is going to lower your activation energy. Um, but that's pretty safe. And there don't really seem to be any nasty. Um, side products there um, so it's a well-established method with very few uh, waste products that can actually use waste products from other reactions to make it so that sounds pretty decent to be fair um, let's compare the costs then so let's have a look okie dokie so 500 mil here uh, only 28 dollars Let's snap one there and snap one there. So 500 mil here is $28 plus a shipping charge because it's a little bit dangerous. Uh, 500 mil here, uh, $61. So in terms of cost there, you're definitely going to go for the sulfuric acid, even if you do add on that. Is it comparable? 
I mean, maybe not with the small volumes, but certainly with the larger volumes. So six lots of 500, you only have to pay that fee once. Uh, so that would make that what, $170-ish. Whereas on the phosphoric acid here, that's still $250. So in terms of costs, uh, despite the fact that you have got to have a fee there for the sulfuric acid for its shipping, um, it still works out as being cheaper. That's uh, £22.57 for the sulfuric acid per 500 ml. So as a comparison there, um, there are clearly pros and cons for each one. The safety, I mean, again, there's pros and cons for each. Um, I think just the raw safety, I'd probably go sulfuric, but the handling of the sulfuric, like shipping it to somewhere is a bit more expensive. So maybe downgrades a, a little bit. The cost, I'd definitely go sulfuric. How easy is it to make? Um, again, they're kind of comparable, but making the sulfuric acid is much more well established and is uh, has got an example of recycling. So actually if i had the choice i would probably go for sulfuric there however that is not necessarily what happens because also we have to bear in mind the reactivity i.e is it going to react quite easily what products are we going to be getting out when we do this reaction so what we're going to do is have a look at two examples one where uh, i've got sodium chloride reacting with phosphoric acid and then we're going to look at it reacting with sulfuric acid I've split this up here into the ionic equation and the full equation. In an exam situation, they might ask you for ionic uh, or for a full equation, a full chemical equation. Uh, and this is something students struggle with a little bit. So ionic equations is where there are charges, but no spectators. Oh, I do not like writing on this. Whereas a full equation, there are no charges, but there are spectators present. I'm not going to scribble that on because that looks absolutely awful. So in the ionic equation. So here uh, we've taken solid sodium chloride, probably just extracted from seawater. Elements from the sea. Um, and that's there in the ionic form. Sodium has a charge of plus one. Chlorine or chloride as it is there has a charge of minus one. So there we go. The chloride ion with the minus. H3PO4, that is the chemical formula for phosphoric acid. We react them together and what is going to happen here is that negativity wants a little bit of positivity from over here. Easiest way to get that is each of those hydrogens would each have a charge of plus one uh, or an oxidation state of plus one. However, overall, that's going to be positive three. Um, not going to worry about that too much now but what the chlorine is going to do is see that and try and just steal one of those hydrogens for itself because the hydrogen is quite a small atom i.e it's only got one electron shell and on that electron shell it's only got one electron um it's relatively easy for that attraction to take place remember like we talked about in elements from the sea there is a small distance between the nucleus and the outer shell there is greater nuclear attractive force so the chlorine is going to go no 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 give me one of those hydrogens uh and the hydrogen phosphate the phosphoric acid is going to go okay then fair enough so there it is, your hydrogen chloride being formed and the hydrogen phosphate there. Please note, we've gone from three over here to two. And we're left over ooh, with a minus charge there just to denote that it has lost an atom of hydrogen. So that would be the ionic equation. Uh, let's shove in the spectators again to see the full equation. So the full equation is relatively simple. So just like I'd written at the top there, NaCl plus H3PO4. Um, and we get hydrogen chloride again. So it's just again, that steals one of those. This, as we saw up here, is left over with a negative charge. What has been lost that has got a positive charge? Whoosh, that goes. Oh, you need a positive charge to cancel out that negative charge? Let me oblige. And that's exactly what it does. So the sodium ion jumps onto that to make it a sodium hydrogen phosphate. Sodium hydrogen phosphate, okay? So that'd be the reaction with phosphoric acid.
It is a question. So if it was sodium iodide, would it still make the sodium hydrogen phosphate still? Uh, yeah. So uh, in that case, what you would get, it'd be uh, hydrogen iodide and the sodium hydrogen phosphate, assuming, obviously, um, that's with the phosphoric acid, not the sulfuric. Uh, state symbols, didn't put in state symbols here. I should have done really. Uh, we could have obviously have S there for solid. Uh, the hydrogen phosphate, sorry, the uh, phosphoric acid is AQ. The hydrogen chloride that is given off is present as a gas. So what they tend to do in these factories is they'll have it all in a reaction vessel. Uh, hydrogen chloride is quite a low density, so it'll probably uh, float up to the top and then be sort of filtered out uh, very easily and sent off wherever it needs to be. Okie dokie, let's have a look at the sulfuric acid then. Sulfuric acid, okay, so once again, we are starting with solid sodium chloride, which is good because that's easy to get hold of. Uh, and concentrated sulfuric acid, there we go as well. Um, uh, okay, so what we're going to get in this case is very similar sort of idea. So there's the chloride ion with its minus charge. Your hydrogen there uh, is two lots of positive, one for each hydrogen. And it's going to be the same situation that the chloride ion comes along, goes sulfate, jog on mate, jog on mate. I'm going to have one of those hydrogens to myself. So the chloride's gonna steal one of those hydrogens for themselves and just like before we get left over with this sort of situation here where you've got the hydrogen chloride and you have the hydrogen sulfate here with a minus charge i don't know why i can't sulfur, uh, circle them particularly well where one hydrogen at uh, two hydrogens there only one here not bothered writing in the one we don't have to but there it is if you want it Getting back to the full equation, uh, so with our ionic, we only had funny charges and no spectators. Let's get the spectators back in there. Come on, sodium, join the party. So here we go, sodium chloride. And just again, that sodium is a positive charge. So that is going to sort of give back to this compound that lost a positive charge here. So that's what it looks like there. So there is your sodium ion jumping on to make up the negative charge. Here we go, we've got some questions. Um, does the different number of hydrogen atoms in the reactants between the two reactions affect the process? Uh, not really, no. I mean, it, it affects the product, obviously, um, because in the first example, oops, so here we've got one hydrogen with sulfate. Uh, in the other one, we had dihydrogen phosphate. So it does affect the name that you get. Um, but we will talk about the effect of acidity uh, properly in a few minutes. State symbols for this equation. Uh, so this starts as a solid. So we could have a solid there. I don't like putting chloride ions as a solid because it feels wrong because the second it does dissolve into this, the sulfuric acid, the sulfuric acid is aqueous. So despite the fact that initially you're putting it in as a solid, the ions would dissociate and it would dissociate into an aqueous solution. So technically uh, that would be AQ. Uh, so AQ, AQ, that says AQ, believe it or not. Uh, this G for gas. Oh, that's a flicky G. Uh, and what would that be? Oh, I can't remember off the top of my head. Part of me is thinking um, that that is a solid actually but I honestly cannot remember off the top of my head. Bear with me, I will, well, I say bear with me. I'll check that for you uh, and I can get back to you later. But equally, I know some of you have been checking up as we go and sent me some cool messages. Uh, feel free to check it. Uh, another question, do you have to use sodium or can you use other group one elements? Uh, in theory, you can use any of the other group one elements. Um, sodium works quite well, again, because of the idea that sodium has only one, two, three electron shells therefore we can again talk about the distance between the nucleus and the outer shell uh, and obviously there's a greater attractive force with something with less shells than there would be with something with more shells in this example it's an alkali metal ion so yeah so you can use other group one metals but you want them to be smaller ones if at all possible that does make it a bit easier lowers the activation energy specifically Okay, uh, rock and roll, let's keep going. Uh, as we've seen before, we probably prefer to use sulfuric acid, um, 
but realistically it doesn't necessarily affect the products i mean you get a slightly different product but they're of equal yeah, like it doesn't it doesn't matter really there's not one that's more harmful than the other let's say uh, and in terms of all the other criteria that we were looking at, we would go for sulfuric. But what we actually find and what most of you have found uh, pretty successfully is that we pretty much exclusively use the phosphoric acid is used for the hydrogen bromide and hydrogen iodide, whereas the sulfuric acid is used for the hydrogen fluoride, which I didn't ask you to check up on, uh, and the hydrogen chloride. Why? Well, as many of you found out, the problem that we have with sulfuric acid, and I say the problem, it's the thing that makes it so useful. As we saw on that website, sulfuric acid is one of the most widely produced chemicals in the flipping world. And the reason for that is because concentrated sulfuric acid is a strong oxidizing agent. That means it's really useful. We can use it to do oxidizing reactions. But that means that if you had it with something that is going to be oxidized slightly further than what you'd want to, um, you will get unintended products that you would not necessarily like. So if we use sulfuric acid for the hydrogen bromide and the hydrogen iodide, look, I can't spell, I will correct that, oxidizy, <laughs> it will go from being, yes, the hydrogen bromide, the hydrogen iodide, but then it goes straight on and is further oxidized, which is a bit, I've shown a bit more easily here. So in this example here, we have got uh, sodium bromide being reacted with the sulfuric acid, which you wouldn't do. That is the wrong acid. But if you did use the wrong acid, what would happen? Well, okay. So first step is the same as everything that we talked about before. Before it was just chloride here and here it's bromide. That's the only difference. So look, same product there. Great. But there will be some of this left over. This will probably be in excess. So any of the, the hydrogen bromide that is formed, that sulfuric acid is going to see that and go, OK, that hydrogen. Again, if we link it back to electron shells, that hydrogen has got even less electron shells, less shielding, a greater attractive force from the nucleus. I'm going to want to react with that instead. And that is exactly what happens. So the sulfuric acid reacts with the hydrogen bromide, which is our desired product that we were trying to get out. So you're losing your hydrogen bromide. Oh, sorry, questions just come through. That's why I got distracted then. Oh, if HCl is only used with sulfuric acid, why was a previous equation using phosphoric as well? Literally just to show you, literally just to demonstrate that it could be done. Because um, in theory, you could do it with acid. But because of the factors that we talked about before, uh, the cost, the safety, um, the availability of the raw reactant, then if at all possible, they'd prefer to use sulfuric acid because it's easier to deal with than the phosphoric so I gave them both as an example, um, but yeah, hydrogen chloride and hydrogen fluoride exclusively use sulfuric acid. Uh, so carrying on with that, thank you for that. That was a nice question. Um, those two reacting there, what we're going to have, this is going to oxidize the heck out of this. It's going to strip that hydrogen off and you're going to be left with bromine gas water and sulfur dioxide which if you're trying to make bromine that might be quite useful as a waste product water is not necessarily an issue however if it's water with some acid still left over in it that's not going to be particularly pleasant is it uh, and sulfur dioxide you should know sulfur dioxide is an asthma trigger it's a respiratory irritant uh, and if dissolved in aqueous solutions oh for example uh, can form uh, sulfuric acid again uh, and then actually can, um, can lead to the production of acid rain if it gets out into the atmosphere. So if you're doing it with hydrogen bromide and hydrogen iodide, avoid the sulfuric acid because it's going to make this. Um, I've seen some past paper questions when they ask you to predict the product. So they'll give you a reaction like this and they'll get you to predict the product. A lot of time it's the sort of multiple choice ones. Um, so this is something that is worth remembering um, that with the bromide and the iodide, you will get the diatomic elemental gas uh, 
although bromine is pretty soluble so it might dissolve back in there a little bit uh, with water and sulfur dioxide another question has come through uh, why is sulfuric acid a strong oxidizing agent but phosphoric isn't uh it's all to do i mean th this is high level stuff you're very welcome to do extra research on this clue h2 so4 h3 po4 i'll leave it there for you uh so here we go using the phosphoric acid with the hydrogen bromide and the hydrogen iodide we do not get these extra products formed we get our desired product of your hydrogen bromide your hydrogen iodide and no waste product except for this little thing here, which is easy enough to get rid of. Okay, um, that is pretty much it. That's all that I wanted to go through with you uh, today. What I have got is level ladder for the, this task. Um, I'm not going to formally mark it for you. So if you wanna have a formal mark of it, uh, this sheet, I'll send this out after this uh, presentation. And you're very welcome to tick off what you have done there as well. So what is next? Where are we at? Uh, so done and reviewed, done and reviewed. That mid-unit test I have converted into a document on Edmodo. Um, that will be released. So there will be a little test for you to do on the reactivity of these halogens, the halides, and basically the stuff that we've done the last few lessons. Uh, following on for that, what we're going to do is have a look at the different halogens and where we actually get them from, um, what processes we need to do that, and any new version of these processes. And why the new process was necessary, LeBlanc, great fun. What we need is you to have an overview what each of the halogens is actually used for. So why is iodine useful? Why is bromine useful? Why is chlorine useful? Um, those are the only three that we need to know about. But if you want to go above and beyond, feel free to find out about fluoride as well. Uh, fluorine slash fluoride. So uh, that's basically what we need to do. So you need to do the uses of each of the halogens, uh, mid-unit test when it is released on Edmodo, uh, and then I will get you your next lessons uh, when I've made them. Um, all notifications will come out through Edmodo. However, what I tend to do is back it up on email as well, just in case. What are the questions we've got here? I.e. only the uses. Yes. Um, so if you lot research what the uses are and then i'll talk you through how we actually get them uh and talk about like the history involved as well it's quite interesting actually um which i never thought i'd say uh and yes le chat we are doing le chat uh you can see that it's at the bottom uh le chatelier's principle yes you did that in year 11 that is the temperature pressure production of ammonia and other things as well uh and we link that to something called equilibrium constant that's what kc means and that is a new part of um, equilibria that we've not necessarily talked about before. Be gone, minions of science. See you next time. I'll, I'll update you via Edmodo and email. Bye. Keep safe. Stay inside. Wash your hands. Don't irritate your parents. <laughs>